So this is a huge episode for me because this is a topic I've been asked about for about a year and a half to two years and have never touched. And now that it's Ramadan, I would say you guys are DMing me maybe every other day about it. And so I'm going to touch on it today in a big way because this is probably going to be the longest podcast I've ever made, not because I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to have actually a special guest on to explain it, as you'll see in a sec. But this is a topic that's going to help you with how to stop listening to music. Now, so many people say it's just so hard for them. They get sucked into it, you know, then they waste their time or they know it's not right or whatever it is that they feel. Or maybe you're not sure about music. Maybe you want to know, like, is it haram? Is it not haram? Like, what's the big deal with it anyway? What's the ruling on that? And so in this podcast, you're going to get just that, how to stop listening to music, everything you want to know about what the scholars say about music. And uh, we're going to go into all of it. You're going to get your answers. And this information changed my life and it actually changed the life of so many women that it has been shared with over the past 20 years. It's kind of one of those all in ones. Take it or leave it. Let's do it. Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much for joining us in the Mindful Muslim Speaks podcast. I'm your host, Mindful Muslim, coming to you three times a week during the time of Ramadan, twice on Mondays and Fridays otherwise. But this is a huge, huge episode because we're going to cover a topic that has been asked, like I said, so many, so many times. And I know it's hard for so many of us who are just really connected. And what I want to say to you is, um, I can totally connect with this need to listen to music because I was raised by parents who did not, how do I say this? They were not practicing parents. Matter of fact, music was just kind of everywhere in my family. And um, I was told, you know, to to practice musical instruments, to sing for with professional teachers. And it just music was something that was such a part of my family's life. When I got to the part where I learned about music and where its place was in Islam, It was just life-changing. And the information I'm going to share with you today is actually not for myself. So here's the thing. Um, This comes from a very famous YouTube video by um, called The End of Music by Kemal al-Meki. And so this um, imam, he has this information. He put it out a long time ago, but it was one of the best videos I've ever found. And when I shared it with all the women I used to teach back, back in the day in New York City and Halakha, and shout out to uh, all the people in New York, um, and Asura, it literally changed our life. And I remember one particular Ramadan where they had said to me, you know, please, can you teach us how to stop listening to music? We don't get it. Is it really haram? Is it not? Like we're just struggling with it. And so I did a presentation and this information is, is just jam packed. Like what you're going to find out from this Imam is he's not just going to pull out Hadith and Quran. I, what I love about what he does is just the first half of it, it's not even that. He doesn't even need to go there. He pulls out so much common sense. It is just undebatable to my, to my, uh, you know, saying. And so subhanAllah, I shared this with them and they were just floored. And one I'm sister in particular, I remember her, she, I'm not going to say her name. She came to me the next day and she's like, everyone needs to know this. And she's like, as a matter of fact, our weddings, our weddings are so haram in the, in the, the Muslim community. I have to tell this. She got like super passionate. She went and she made an entire pamphlet with all this information. She said, she came to me and she said, can I present this in the next usra? I think women just need to really, you know, hear all about this. She was so pumped, right? She puts it all into a pamphlet. She does a huge presentation. The girls are like crying. Everybody's like, oh my gosh. Uh, The same information I'm going to share with you today. And then she's like, that's it. I feel like I did a great deed. Now I know these women, next time we see them in a wedding, they're not going to do this. They're not going to do that. So about a month later, because we all are very close, uh, we all get invited to a wedding. (laughs) We all go there. And lo and behold, everybody does what they normally do. No difference Nobody applied any of the information she shared. Everyone went right back to normal. And she was totally like destroyed, let's just say. She's like, I presented all the facts, but they didn't follow it. And so what I would say is this. The information I'm going to share today is kind of undeniable. I'm not going to lie. And at the same time, so many people are going to hear it and might just go back. But I'm going to tell you there is a very famous story where Rasulullah Sallam, he, um, he's met by someone named Jabir. And Jabir said, I want to meet the man who, like, when people uh, are told something from this man, everyone listens. Everyone listens. 
And Jabir, when he met the Prophet, peace be upon him, because he was referring to the Prophet, peace be upon him, the Prophet said, you know, you know, to him, uh, a greeting and back and forth. There's a whole long story with the greeting. But at the end of the day, he said, give me advice. And the advice the Prophet, peace be upon him, gave him was never um, like curse at people or argue with people at a certain level where you're like being, you know, haram, like uh, cursing or, you know, talking bad words to them and criticizing them. Never, never do this. And he had given him this advice. And he gave him an explanation and Jabir walked away and he said, never I did that again. But just like he said, subhanAllah, this man, Rasulullah when he gave an advice, like it stuck with you. And what I want to say is this particular information I'm going to give you today is a compilation of what all the madhab say, all the famous the scholars and all the words of the Prophet, peace be upon him in the Quran. And it stuck with me the same way it stuck with Jabir, the same way it stuck with so many of the Sahaba. When they heard it, they would just listen. I implore you to listen to the information today, make your decision on it. And then if you feel it truly, truly speaks to you, stick with it. Because I promise you, it is going to be something that can change your life. And last thing I'll say is, for the Qur'an, I was never able to memorize the Qur'an to the extent that I can now until I left music. And may the scholar say, there is a place in the heart where music and the Qur'an, it cannot live. And the Shaykh, he will talk about this in the saying, but I'm going to play him because it's better his voice than my voice. He says it so eloquently. He's so enjoyable to listen to. Um, I encourage you to listen to him in general. He's, he's just a great imam to listen to. But yeah. This is it, the end of music, Kamal al Makki. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Amma ba'd. The end of music. This is a message for our believing brothers and sisters in Iman who are afflicted with listening to music or were confused by statements of scholars who said that it was permissible. This is a message for our brothers and our sisters who listen to music and their hearts have become attached to it, and their emotions were moved and they were swayed by it. But we have no doubt that there are believers who long for paradise and love Allah and want to come closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. They are our brothers and our sisters, our uncles and our parents, who have been temporarily defeated by the shaitan, but we know that they, inshaAllah, can defeat him multiple times. What can I say about music and where do I begin? It has affected the hearts and swayed people away from the straight path and has caused the religion to take the back seat. It has caused people's addiction to the point where they left the Qur'an and abandoned the masajid. What can I say about music? If you ask someone the simplest question about the Prophet wasallam, they cannot respond. If you ask them about the mothers of the believers, their own mothers, they could not even tell you their names. If you ask them about the Prophets of Allah or the companions of Allah anhum ajma'een, they cannot respond to your questions. But they can tell you about individuals who sing and curse all day and produce the worst messages for our youth, offering nothing positive to their communities or to the environment. They can tell you about those people and their childhood and where they grew up and who they married and who they're dating and what year they put out their albums. There is one study that says the youth from between the ages of 15 and 20, they listen to about 26.8 hours of music per week. About 27 hours of music per week. And those who are 55 and older, they listen to about 13 hours of music per week. And now with it being available online for free and many devices that can carry thousands and thousands of songs, you can expect these numbers to increase. The sad part, brothers and sisters, is that any time someone commits a sin, he is using the blessing given to him by Allah Azza wa Jal to disobey Allah Azza wa Jal. And the sad thing is that we're going to be asked about all the blessings and how we use them on this earth. And hearing is one of the greatest of the blessings given to us. And Allah Azza wa Jal will ask us about what we listen to on this earth. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says in the Quran, إِنَّ السَّمْعَ وَالْبَصَرَ وَالْفُؤَادِ كُلُّ أُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ عَنْهُمْ مَسْعُولًا Here Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, Verily the hearing and the sight and the heart, you will be questioned by Allah about all of these things. And so the righteous then, they have recognized that the shaitan is their enemy and they stayed away from the path that leads to the shaitan. When Allah Azza wa Jal commanded Iblis alayhi la'natullah to prostrate to Adam, Iblis refused and disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And then he vowed that he's going to misguide all human beings. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned to Iblis some of the ways that in which he's going to use people and to take people away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah Azza wa Jal tells him, وَاسْتَفْسِزْ مَنِ اسْتَطَعْتَ مِنْهُمْ بِصَوْتِكْ وَأَجْلِبْ عَلَيْهِمْ بِخَيْلِكَ وَرَجْلِكْ وَشَارِكْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ وَعِدُهُمْ وَمَا يَعِدُهُمْ الشَّيْطَانُ إِلَّا غُرُورًا In this verse, Allah Azza wa Jal tells the shaytan, and befool them gradually, those whom you can amongst them, with your voice. So what do you think would be the voice of the shaytan? And right now these verses that we're going to mention, they do not say anything about music being haram, but you start to see a kind of music being put in a bad light. But these verses are not saying that it's haram so far. But so far now we're seeing that the, Allah Azza wa is telling the shaytan, guide whom, misguide whomever you can from humanity with your voice. So what is this voice? It includes songs and music and anything else. It's a very general term. Anything else that calls to the disobedience to Allah or calls anything away from Allah. So not just music, but this is a general term. And make assaults on them with your cavalry and infantry. And this also incur, in, includes when someone is walking with their own feet to something that is haram or something that's prohibited. And share with them wealth and children. Wealth meaning tempt them to earn their money in illegal and haram ways. And their children by getting people to try to commit illegal uh, or illicit sexual activity. And make promises to them. But shaitan promises them nothing but deceit. So we're still not saying or showing ayat or evidences that it's haram, but we're starting to show that it's one of the tools of the shaitan. And before we get to the sayings of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, and the evidence from the Qur'an and the Sunnah, and the great scholars and the Imams, we want to look at some logical evidence that will tell you there is probably something wrong with music and that it's probably not halal. Just from looking at it, from a distance and analyzing it, we're going to see that it's something that's not surrounded with good and it's probably something that's not halal. Because I believe that every good Muslim knows deep down in their heart that music is haram. Perhaps some of us don't want to face that reality, but deep down they know that it's haram. And this is illustrated in this story where a man came to the companion, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah. And he said, يَا ابْنَ عَبَّاسِ أَرَأَيْتَ الْغِنَاءَ أَحَلَالٌ هُوَ أَمْ حَرَامٌ Oh, Ibn Abbas, this music, this singing, is it halal or haram? And here, ghina specifically is singing. So what is he asking about? He is asking about the ghina, the singing of the Arab, the Bedouin Arabs and their singing. This is singing that does not include talking about fornication or homosexuality. It does not show people dancing or videos people Yani wearing, uh, I'm ashamed to say it, but we you know wearing bikinis or things of that sort or using bad words. So he's asking about this. Is this permissible? So Ibn Abbas tells him, أَرَأَيْتَ الْحَقَّ وَالْبَاطِلِ إِذَا جَاءَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَأَيْنَ يَكُونُ الْغِنَاءِ He says, do you see the truth and falsehood? When they come forth on the Day of Judgment, which side do you think music will be on? You think it will be on the side of truth? on the side of the Prophets, on the side of the Qur'an, and Dhikr, and Psalm, and Salah, and Allah Azza wa Jal, or it will be on the side of falsehood. So the man said, يَكُونُ مَعَ الْبَاطِلِ That it will be with falsehood. So Ibn Abbas says, فَمَاذَا بَعْدَ الْحَقِّ إِلَّا الضَّلَالِ إِذْهَبْ فَقَدْ أَفْتَيْتَ نَفْسَكِ He tells him, what is besides the truth, meaning if it's not the truth, it's falsehood. Go, you have answered your own question by yourself. So the man knew the answer by himself, and I believe that we all know the answer. So let's look at just some of the logical evidences. We find that halal things and good things, they generally have good descriptions and good attributes. When you look at prayer, you look at fasting, reciting the Qur'an, when people gather to pray, generally good things happen in these gatherings. It's a good gathering. When people gather to recite the Qur'an, it's a good gathering. And you don't find it being surrounded by things that are haram. But things that are haram are usually surrounded with things that are haram. And look at the things that surround music. Whenever people gather around music, there are typically not gatherings of righteous people. 
You don't typically see the Imam of the Masjid in that gathering and the Mashayikh and the Mufti of the, of the city. You don't find righteous people typically. And you find intermingling and women with their hair uncovered and women who are poorly dressed and you will find alcohol and dancing and smoking. And that night usually ends with the sin of zina, fornication, والعياذ billah. So this is the first indication then that it's haram because it's always accompanied and surrounded with things that are haram. The second indication then, and still without going into any of the hadith, is the feeling that you get from music. It does not bring you closer to Allah. Even the biggest music lover, get a Muslim who is the biggest music lover, he will not be pleased if he hears rap music in the masjid. Why? Because he knows this is not a feeling you're supposed to get in the masjid. We're talking about someone who is the biggest music lover in the community. If he enters the Jum'ah and he finds the Imam app on the member with a big uh, boom box, then the Imam hits play and then a funky beat comes over and then the Imam starts to freestyle. Yes? The biggest music lover in the audience will become upset and offended. Why? Because they know this is something that is totally opposite of the feeling that he came to get. He came to be reminded of Allah Azza wa Jal and to listen to the ayat and the Quran and the ahadith which take him in one direction but the feeling that you get from music takes you in the opposite direction. And that's why many many years ago the early scholars of Islam they used to say that music and the Quran cannot be combined in the heart of the believer. There's not enough room in your heart for both of them. You either love one or the other. And like I said, you try that and test that when you get in someone's vehicle, you find they either have music tapes or they have Qur'an tapes. They listen to one or the other. And the Qur'an it takes you in a direction where it prevents you from following your desires and it commands chastity and it commands modesty and it controls these desires and prevents you from following the steps of the shaitan. And music takes you in a direction that's totally opposite. So of the feelings that music causes, it causes people uh, to feel less shame. They feel a lack of shame and they're less shy. And they're not embarrassed, male or female. You see when there's loud music played, they're not, not very embarrassed to jump up and down and twirl and fall on the ground and get up again. They're not embarrassed to do that. And the women are not embarrassed to do that. Have you ever heard of a female dancer who was too shy because there were men in the room? She said, I don't want to dance, there's too many men watching me. Or I'm not dressed properly, I'm not covered right. Rarely is it associated with haya. You, rarely is it associated with these feelings of iman. But you find these people, they don't care. And notice how when people repent and they come back to Allah, they usually stop going to nightclubs and parties. Why is that? Because they know these are bad places and these places are also associated with music. The second thing concerning the, the feeling that you get from music is that it causes this fitna, it causes this, uh, it arouse, arouses desires, the sexual desires in people. And even the fitna of the voice of women. And so it's not just enough that the voice of women is enough to stir emotions in a man, but now these female singers, they're purposely making their voice softer and they're dancing in ways that are sexually suggestive and they're not wearing proper clothing. So what do you expect? Except that the man's heart is going to be moved by that and his feelings are going to be moved by that. And this is something that even Christians are aware of. There's a church called the Church of Christ. That's it. That's the name of it. And they don't have, they don't believe in music in church. They don't believe in dancing. They look at it as sexually suggestive. And it's so surprising and shocking when Muslims see that there's absolutely nothing wrong with this type of behavior. When we look at the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal says for the women, وَلَا يَضْرِبْنَ بِأَرْجُلِهِنَّ لِيَعْلَمَ مَا يُخْفِينَ مِنْ زِينَتِهِنَّ وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا أَيُّهَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ Here Allah is saying to the women that they should not strike their feet in order to draw attention to their hidden ornaments. So forget the voice, the soft voice of the woman while she's shaking her hair from left and right and dancing and singing and jumping up and down. Allah is forbidding the Muslim women who are covered from head to toe to not strike their feet in a loud way to, to, on the ground so that their ankle bracelets and whatever ornaments they're wearing will shake and make that sound and men will just know. 
They will not see anything. They will just know that this woman is or, you know, adorned with these things. If Allah is preventing this voice, what about then the woman coming and telling, you know, saying sweet things and sweet words? Huh? طيب. So, the music also then, the effects of it, it can move you in various ways. There was an, uh, an Arab musician, his name was Al-Farabi. This is from the early Muslims or from the past generations. And it is said that he would play his instrument and sing in a certain way and the listeners would cry. And then he would play and sing in a certain way and then the people would laugh. And then he would play and sing in a certain way and the people would sleep and then he would walk out. So do not tell me that it does not affect people's behavior or how they act. And on a final note on the feelings, which is better for you and brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is better for your heart and strength, strengthens your iman? Definitely it's the Qur'an and it's not listening to something like music. So how can it be the case and how can we know this answer and yet people listen to more music than they do to the Qur'an? What about then the message that you get from songs? And now here specifically I'm talking about things that you hear like the, the MTV type of mainstream pop culture music and even you know if you want to consider the music that's played in the Muslim lines generally we're not talking about uh, nasheed that calling you to Allah we're talking about the things that the majority of young men and women listen to predominantly this type of music that they listen to what are the messages that come out of that? Have you ever heard one of these singers warning from alcohol or calling people to hijab or calling to righteousness? But they sing about zina and when they sing about love, are they talking about a man loving his wife? They're always talking about a love that is for, forbidden. And this is from Isha'at al-Fahisha. Allah Azza wa says in the Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُحِبُّونَ أَن تَشِيعَ الْفَاحِشَةَ فِي الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ Here Allah Azza wa is saying, those who love to see scandal published or broadcast amongst the believers will have grievous penalty or punishment in this life and the next. So again, let's think about what this ayah is saying. Allah Azza wa is saying, those who would love, not those who do it, not those who are pushing for it, those who would love for the evil deeds to spread, they are the ones getting this punishment. And they just wanted to see that. Not those who are actively involved. So what are these messages from these songs telling us? And for that reason, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the companion radiallahu anhu, he used to say, Al-ghina ruqyatu zina What does it mean, ruqyatu zina It means it is the way and the facilitator of fornication, of zina. And this is him speaking about the songs and the, and the music in his time. When a servant girl would sing and she would not dance and she would not do it publicly and she would not call to fornication nor talk about it. But yet it is called ruqyatu zina it is mentioned by the scholar Ibn Qudama. He mentioned in a tawabin that a righteous man passed by a house and he heard a woman singing inside. And so what happened? He was walking by but he slowed down a little bit so he can hear this woman. And so the owner came out and he said, do you want to come in to listen? So the man said, he said, A'udhu Billah. You seek refuge from Allah. So the man tells him, he insisted. Come inside and just listen. So the man says, he let me sit in a place where I can't see her and she can't see me. So there is now a hijab between them, uh, like a partition between them. So then the man entered and she sang for him and she beautified her voice and she softened her voice and she used the weapon of the shaytan. So then the owner of the house tells him, would you like me to remove the sitr, the partition between you and her? So I said, the man said, no, because he was a righteous man. So he insisted until he removed the partition, until he saw her. And so he combined the fitna of hearing and the fitna of seeing. And that continued until he was completely overtaken with her. And so this righteous man then would come every day to listen to her. Until one day she told him, Wallahi, I love you. So he said, I couldn't keep a straight face there. She said, Wallahi, I love you. So he said, and I also love you, you see. And she called him to zina. And she said, what would prevent you? The place is empty. 
and he was shaken. And he said, Bala. He said, yes, the place is empty. وَلَكِنِّي لَا آمَنْ أَنْ أُفَاجَأُ بِالْقَضَاءِ And I, do, I, I'm not, I do not feel safe that I would not be surprised with the qada of Allah, the decree of Allah that I might die right now. ثُمَّ بِجَمْرٍ كَالْغَضَى ثُمَّ بِصِيَاطٍ وَزَقُّومٍ وَتَهْوِيلٍ وَرُجُومٍ So he starts to mention the punishment, punishments of the Day of Judgment. He says, I'm not sure that that won't happen to me. And he went away weeping and he never returned. <coughs> But look at how the shaitan almost destroyed this man. And how many young men have become attached to female singers and when they hear their voices or see their pictures, their hearts begin to race. And how many young women have posters of men in, and in their pictures in their bedrooms and in their rooms. And so we see the effect of singing on women in particular. Yazid ibn al-Walid, he used to say, Ya Bani Umayyah, he's giving advice to Bani Umayyah, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْغِنَى فَإِنَّهُ يُذْهِبُ الْحَيَاءَ وَيَزِيدُ الشَّهْوَةَ وَيَهْدُمُ الْمُرُوءَةَ وَإِنَّهُ لَيُنُوبُ عَنِ الْخَمْرُ وَيَفْعَلُ مَا يَفْعَلُهُ السُّكْرُ فَإِن كُنْتُمْ لَا بُدَّ فَاعِلِينَ فَجَنِّبُوهُ النِّسَاءِ فَإِنَّ الْغِنَى أَدَاعِيَةُ الزِّنَى So he's saying, O Bani Umayyah, you know, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْغِنَى Stay away from singing. Because it will take the modesty, the shyness away from people. And it will increase the desires of the lusts of people. وَيَهْدُمُ الْمُرُوءَ will take away like the, like the manlyhood of people. وَإِنَّهُ لَيُنُوبُ عَنِ الْخَمْرِ Like it can replace, it can take the place of khamr, of alcohol, meaning it can cause this kind of intoxication in the mind. وَيَفْعَلُ مَا يَفْعَلُهُ السُّكُرِ And it can do what alcohol can do to people. فَإِن كُنْتُمْ لَا بُدَّ فَاعِلِينَ If you're really going to do it, there's no other way. فَجَنِّبُوهُ النِّسَاء Then keep it away from women. At least go and do not let the women hear this. فَإِنَّ الْغِنَاءَ أَدَاعِيَةُ الزِّنَاء Singing, this is one of the, the callers to fornication. Also the Khalifa Suleiman ibn Abdul Malik, he heard someone singing. So he was upset. He heard someone singing at night. So in the morning he had the person or these singers gathered and they brought them to him. So he tells them, إِنَّ الْفَرَسَ لَيَصْحَلْ فَتَسْتَوْدِقُ لَهُ الرَّمَكَ That meaning that when the male horse makes his sound, the female horse prepares to mate. وَإِنَّ الْفَحْلَ لَيَهْدِرْ فَتَبَّعُ لَهُ النَّاقَ And the camel also he makes the sound and the she-camel gets ready for him. وَإِنَّ التَّيْسَ لَيَنِبْ فَتَسْتَحْرِمُ لَهُ الْعَنْزِ And the, 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 the same thing also with the sheep or the goat, uh, the, male, the, the male goat makes the sound and she, the, ma the female also gets prepared for him. وَإِنَّ الرَّجُلُ لَيَتَغَنَّى فَتَشْتَاقُ لَهُ الْمَرْأَى And the man would sing and then the woman would long for him. And then he ordered them to be taken away from the area. But actually, he actually first ordered them to be punished most severely. And Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the scholar, was there and he told them that that is not like a, pro uh, a prescribed punishment. So he had them only sent away to another area. So this is the effect that male singers can have on the women. He had a very nice voice and he would recite poetry in a very nice rhythmic and melodious way. And this would also help the camels as they would travel. And it would make the, the, for, the, for the camels, it would make them easier for them, this beat, this rhythm that they would walk to. The Prophet ﷺ told Anjasha just to begin To, to make these, like this singing or this recitation. And it was a very nice voice. And then the Prophet ﷺ feared for the women at the end of the caravan. So he said, Ya Anjasha, ruaydaka ya Anjasha, rifqan bil qawarir. He said, Ya Anjasha, it's time to stop. It's enough now. Out of fear for al qawarir, which are, which are glass bottles, but he see, he, liken the women to that because they're delicate. So why did the Prophet ﷺ stop him? Because it would have a bad effect on the hearts of women when they hear this man with the beautiful voice. Because it affects people like that. Also there was a man, his name was Ma'mar ibn al-Muthanna. Uh, Ma ibn al He narrates about the poet uh, Al-Hutayya, his name was. And he was traveling with his daughters and he came near to a people from Bani Kalb, the tribe of Bani Kalb. So they feared 
and that he would dislike something he sees from them and he might attack them with his poetry. So this man Al-Hutayya, he was known for attacking people with his words and his poetry. And if he attacked you, it became popular and it was kind of recorded against you. And he was so famous for this that one day he found nobody to attack, he attacked his own mother in his poetry. And it gets worse than that. One day he really wanted to attack somebody. He couldn't find anybody. So he looked in the mirror and saw the reflection of his face and started to write poetry cursing his own face. So you can imagine now why they were so afraid of this man. So they came to him and they said, tell us what you like so we can do it. And what you hate so we can stay away from it. We don't want to make you upset. So this man, he said to them, do not لا تأتوني كثيرا فتملوني and so do not visit me too much, you will get bored of me. وَلَا تُسْمِعُونِ أَغَانِ شَبِيبَاتِكُمْ فَإِنَّ الْغِنَى رُقْيَةُ الزِّنَى He said, do not let me hear the songs of your young men and women, because singing is one of the, like, the facilitators to zina. And what he meant was, I have my daughter with me on this trip, and I would not like her to hear that. And I'm not going to read you the examples of lyrics uh, from contemporary music today, or from hip-hop or rap, whatever they call you. The reason I'm not going to do that is I'm too ashamed to do that. Because they really talk about extremely, extremely filthy things, and bad words left and right. And even if there were no sisters in the room, I would be too ashamed to recite to you some of the lyrics that are being said in today's music. But the people know, uh, a lot of people are very familiar with the explicit type of music and the themes that they're talking about and we as we mentioned they're never righteous things it's always the worst of behavior that they're calling you to so then what about now we discuss the message so what about the, the writers of this message what is the message that the writers of musical lyrics are trying to get across to you what are they writing about and who writes these words are they scholars upstanding individuals righteous men and women you look at heavy metal it's, you know, usually sex, drugs, devils, and killing yourself. And I know I'm generalizing. Rap, it's sex, drugs, murder, garden tools, and how many garden tools that you have. You understand? Degrading women, talking about, you know, pimping and things that are so embarrassing to mention. Blues, it's about hard times, broken hearts, and being broke yourself. Country music, my truck broke down, my dog ran away, and I have... And I have a broken heart as well. So, are the writers of these songs people that you would like to get advice and words of wisdom from? What is Puff Diddy attempting to tell you in his lyrics? What would you get advice from someone whose name is Snoop Doggy Kelb? Snoop Doggy Kelb. So, and would you take advice from me today, Kamal al makki if I was sitting here dressed in baggy and sagging pants and I had a grill in my mouth and I was cursing, would you accept advice from me, any kind of advice from me? So why do people then listen to the lyrics of these people and accept their advice? So someone might argue that this doesn't affect me. You know, I listen to this music, it's just entertainment and it doesn't affect me. And someone like that, I would ask, have you ever been to a high school? When you enter a high school today and you look at people, can you just from how they dress, identify those who listen to heavy metal and punk rock just from how they dress, and those who listen to hip-hop just from how they dress, and who are the people who are called the goths or listen to, isn't that a subculture that is related to gothic music? And cases of suicides from listening to songs you might remember in the 80s, there was a, a, a lawsuit against a man, Ozzy Osbourne, because uh, you know some kid listened to his song and he shot himself, he committed suicide. I mean, whether or not he told him to do so, but the point is, some people are affected by these kinds of things. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz radiallahu anhu, the Khalifa, he wrote to the Mu'addib, the, the tutor of his sons. The Mu'addibin would teach poetry and refined manners and things of that sort. So he wrote to him saying, let your first lesson to them be the hatred of musical instruments that begin with the shaitan and end with the wrath of Allah. For it reached me from the people of knowledge that listening to music and songs grows hypocrisy in the heart the same way water causes plants to grow. So with that we say to the one who listens to music, O oh Muslim, lawful things have good attributes. Where is the good in singing, dancing and listening to flutes? 
Can we compare the words of singers and sounds of musicians to the glorious Qur'an, its lessons, wisdoms, and admonitions? How many singers do you know and give admiration? And how many do you know of the companions and the following generation? How much do you spend on singers from your dollars compared to how much you know of Islamic scholars? Do you see how much is memorized of music songs while you ignore the book to which memorization belongs? How much do you memorize of these incantations and sway back and forth in intoxication? Have you not seen those who follow the misguided and increase the loudness of the music when they should hide it? And who writes these songs, Thinger, thinkers or men of academia or maybe scholars like Ahmad Malik or maybe Ibn Taymiyyah? All you who listen to music, don't you see that all the songs of the world and all the lyrics you've seen wouldn't compare in reward to Alif Lam Mi? It replaces the Qur'an, brothers and sisters. It replaces the Qur'an in people's hearts. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz said to his, son, his sons, أُحَذِّرُكُمُ الْغِنَى أُحَذِّرُكُمُ الْغِنَى أُحَذِّرُكُمُ الْغِنَى I warn you of singing three times. فَمَسْتَمَعَهُ عَبْدٌ إِلَّا أَنْسَاهُ اللَّهُ الْقُرْآنِ No one listens to it except that Allah will cause him to forget the Qur'an. And people listen to music and they can cry and they listen to the Qur'an and they don't cry. And they can stand for hours on their feet at a concert, but if the taraweeh gets a little bit too long, they cannot bear it. One scholar asked someone, which does Allah, Allah love more, Qur'an or music? And the man said, Qur'an. He said, then why do not you, why don't you love what Allah loves more? What is your reason for that? There's a question from the greatest website in the world. Anyone know what that is? IslamQA.com, you've heard that before, huh? Look at this question. I'm not going to read the answer or anything, but just look at the way this person framed this question. He said, I'm a person who believes in the existence of Allah. No matter how far I stray from Allah, I turn back to Him with humbleness. But I listen to classical music, and I think that it is the best thing in my life. It does not provoke desire. Rather, it helps me review myself and my mistakes. I, felt that it's, I feel that Islam is a backward religion when I hear those who say that all kinds of music are haram. Just look at this question. And the Shaykh tells him, you said it's the best thing in your life, and you didn't mention Allah, and you didn't mention the Qur'an, and you didn't say Islam was the best thing in your life. Look at how it takes over people's lives, people. And he says, it helps me review myself and my mistakes. So the Shaykh said to him, you obviously, it didn't help you review this mistake when you wrote it. And he tells me, you feel Islam is a backward religion just because of this? So you see how much now it takes over people's lives and their hearts. And so they defend it and they tell you, well, it calms you down and it relaxes your nerves. So which calms you down and relaxes your nerves? That or when you have a calamity, you listen to music or you run and you rush to Allah Azza wa Jal and you beg and you cry to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Didn't Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala say in the Quran, الذين آمنوا وتطمئن قلوبهم بذكر الله ألا بذكر الله تطمئن القلوب. Those who believe and whose hearts find satisfaction in the remembrance of Allah. For without doubt in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find satisfaction. And as some scholars argue, if music really made you, you know, a more refined person and more gentle and calms your nerves and so on and so forth, if it did soften the hearts, then the hearts of the musicians would be the best of hearts and their attitude and behavior would be the best. But what do we find as a reality? That they are the people who behave the worst. So that means it can't be something that gets you to behave better. So, before we even started to look at the ayat and the hadith, we saw that it was surrounded with haram. The people involved with it and the people who write it are not amongst the righteous. And many times they're from the dissolutes and their messages are not good and the effects of music are not good, and the effects of music uh, bring, do not bring you closer to Allah. And the worst thing is that it replaces the Qur'an, and it takes up so much of people's time as we looked at the numbers. And generally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make halal for us everything that is good, and He will make haram for us everything that is bad. يُحِلُّ لَهُمُ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَيُحَرِّمُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْخَبَائِثِ and so you'll find anything that is khabith, anything that is bad or impure, will be at some point or another prohibited or disliked in Islam. And so under this ayah you can easily put something like cigarettes. No one will say, you know, cigarettes are from the tayyibat. They're definitely from 
the khaba'ith. And so they would fall under this ayah. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, and it is a Sahih hadith. He said, there will be amongst my ummah people who permit, لَيْكُنَنَّ مِنْ أُمَّتِي أَقْوَامٌ يَسْتَحِلُّونَ الْحِرَى وَالْحَرِيرِ وَالْخَمْرَ وَالْمَعَازِفِ There will be people from my ummah who permit four things. يَسْتَحِلُّونَ means literally they make halal. Al-hira, which is uh, adultery or fornication, and silk, and alcohol, and musical instruments. This is a Sahih Hadith in the book of Bukhari. So the first thing is the Prophet ﷺ said, يَسْتَحِلُّونَ Which means they make halal. Which means that the things he's about to mention, they're all haram. Otherwise he wouldn't say they make it halal, if it was already halal. And the word used in the Hadith was, is ma'azif, which literally means musical instruments. And this includes, it's a general term, it includes all kinds of musical instruments. And as the, as the ayat that we heard, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْتَرِي لَهُ الْحَدِيثِ لِيُذِلَّ بِهِ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمِ وَيَتَّخِذُهَا هُزْوَةً And Allah Azza wa Jalla is saying, and of mankind is he who purchases idle talk. To mislead people from the path of Allah without knowledge. And so, by way of mockery, for such there will be a humiliating torment. This is in Surah Luqman. So here in this verse then, it is not a clear indication that music is haram. But again, it's being mentioned in a bad light in the Qur'an. But then we see what, how the companions and the early Muslims and the scholars of Islam understood this word, lahwa al-hadith, which could be idle talk. So the majority of the mufassireen, they say that lahwa al-hadith in this verse refers to singing. And another group said that it is every kind of sound dealing with entertainment. And which includes flutes and stringed instruments and so on. And in Tafsir al-Tabari, the scholar of the Ummah, Abdullah ibn Abbas, says that this means singing. And Mujahid, rahimahullah, also says this means playing the, the drum, the tabl. And Al-Hasan al-Basri said that this ayah was revealed concerning singing and musical instruments. So these are all great scholars and this is how they understood this verse. And one of the, one of the more recent scholars, Al-Sa'di rahimahullah, said that this includes all manner of haram speech. So, we're starting to see in summary that either it refers to just singing and music, or any false thing that leads you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, including lying, backbiting, or including music and singing. But of the other scholars also, uh, Ibn Qayyim said the interpretation of the Sahaba, the companions, and the generation after them, that lahu al-hadith refers to singing is sufficient, he's saying. And Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu was asked, what does it mean lahu al-hadith? And he swore by Allah, وَالَّذِي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ إِنَّهُ الْغِنَى Three times, وَالَّذِي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ إِنَّهُ الْغِنَى وَالَّذِي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ إِنَّهُ الْغِنَى And this is Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, who says that I took 30 suwar fresh from the mouth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he has spoken the truth even if he does not swear to us and repeat it three times. And it was also re, re, uh, re, yani related or narrated that with a sahih uh, snad chain of narration that Ibn Umar also said that this ayah is referring to singing. So whether or not you want to argue that this ayah now is saying it's haram or not, it's just mentioning it in a bad light, we find that the majority of the mufassireen and the early Muslims and the, and the companions of the Prophet ﷺ are saying that this is talking about music. And so look at the names that the Muslims had for music. They didn't call it musiqa as they do now in Arabic. They didn't call it art and all these fancy names that we give it. These are the names that Muslims used to refer to music. They would call it Allahu, Allahu, Al-Batil, Al-Zur, Al-Muka, Al-Tasdiya, Ruqyatul Zina, Quran al-Shaytan, منبت النفاق في القلب الصوت الأحمق الصوت الفاجر صوت الشيطان مزمور الشيطان and the sumud they would call it vain talk false talk falsehood the facilitator of fornication the way of fornication the Quran of the shaytan the flute of the shaytan the sound of the shaytan the immoral sounds these were the names that people had for music and when you look at what people used to call something it gives you an indication of how they felt about it when it was first introduced to them. For example now, in, in a lot of Arabs they refer to the singer as a fanan. 
Fanan is a singer. As the fana, the word Fanan literally it, it refers to a donkey. It's, it's a donkey that is striped, which is like a zebra. So that means when the Muslims started to see all these singers, they gave them a name that was befitting and they called them donkeys. Also like the, the theater in Arabic is referred to as the Masrah. The theater is called the Masrah. Masrah is the place where the animals like gather and eat and, and relieve themselves and things of that sort. That means also when the righteous Muslims first saw people on stage and acting silly, they said, well, these people act like animals and they called the, say, the, the theater, the stage, the Masrah, where the animals fool around. And also you find the early Muslims used to call male singers, the male singer was called the Muhannaf. This is someone who was a, an effeminate type of man. Someone who, you know, is, you know, flaky. <laughs> the Prophet ﷺ said, two sounds are accursed in this world and the next. A sound of musical instruments in a time of happiness and a sound of wailing during a calamity. And we're going to look at some of these hadith more uh, in, in the next talk, insha'Allah. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَشْهَدُونَ الزُّورِ وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا and those who do not witness the, like the falsehood, and if they pass by some evil talk or evil play, they pass by it with dignity, meaning it does not affect them. So Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyyah, and who can tell us who is Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyyah? The son of Ali radiallahu anhu, and he was not his son from Fatima, so he was referred to as ibn al-Hanafiyyah. He was asked, what is a zur that we just mentioned in this verse? He said, innahu al-ghina li'annahu يَمِيلُ بِكَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ He said, it's singing because it diverts you away from the mention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, Allah Azza wa says in the Qur'an to the kuffar of Quraysh, أَفَمِنْ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ تَعْجَبُونَ وَتَضْحَكُونَ وَلَا تَبْكُونَ وَأَنْتُمْ سَامِدُونَ In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, like you marvel from this speech, and you laugh and you do not cry, وَأَنْتُمْ سَامِدُونَ Ibn Abbas said, Samidun means Mughannun, that you're singing. The Arabs used to say, Ismud lana, meaning, Ghanni lana, sing for us. And this is, uh, you know, meaning that when the Quraysh, with the, the Prophet ﷺ or the Muslims would recite Quran, they would drown out the verses of the Quran by their singing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rebukes them here. So when we say then, that it is haram, we're accused of being backwards, people who are against art and creativity. But really in music, it has wasted the time of our young men and women with hours and hours of listening to it and following the news of those who create it. And they have not learned their religion, nor have they learned any other sciences and have not even become involved in politics. I've visited one country in Eurasia and the government there, part of their policy is to keep the youth occupied with music constantly. There is absolutely nothing on their television except music all night and day. And the only time that is interrupted is to show them a movie. Music all the time. And so it is very disheartening and very sad that all the youth, the young men and women, the only thing they care about is this musician and he divorced so and so and this one has a new album out and that's all they think about and they're not involved in anything that helps them better their life or their society or their country and so music begins with the shaitan and it ends with the anger of ar rahman and it moves people to ugly things and it decreases your haya and so you see people they clap and they move up and down and they scream and they spin and they're not ashamed and we seek refuge and the protection of Allah from these things. Some of the early Muslims used to say singing brings hypocrisy in people and inad that they're stu become stubborn and kadib lying and riqqa which is muyu'a which is when uh, the man is not like you know uh, manly or like you know hard anymore becomes soft and he becomes softened by this. So we look at some of the opinions and the, of the companions and the scholars of Islam. And the companions, there are some issues that the Sahaba disagreed upon. So you can choose this side or that side. But on the issue of music, they did not disagree once. There is no disagreement of the companions. They have ijma' on this issue. Consensus that this thing, that music was haram. 
There is not any companion who said that it's okay. And anyone who says so, we challenge them to bring us proof of any one companion who said that it's okay. Ibn Mas'ud held that listening to musical instruments give birth to disbelief and hypocrisy in the heart. Ibn Abbas said it's haram. Ibn Mas'ud, Jabir ibn Abdullah. Not single, a single one of them said that it's okay. And of the four Imams, Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he mentions the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa is the strictest in this regard. And his comments and the comments of his students are the harshest. He says, I mean the, the points are, his companions, and by that mean that the students of Imam Abu Hanifa, they clearly stated that it's haram to listen to all musical instruments. And they said the person who listens to them is a fasiq. Fasiq is someone who is a dissolute, someone who lacks moral restraint, or a rebellious evildoer, whose testimony should be rejected. So just for listening to Jay-Z, we do not accept your testimony anymore. And they also said that music and listening to music and enjoying it is kufr. Now, they said it's kufr, but they based that on a weak hadith. So we're not saying what they say, but it just shows you to what extent, to what extent the Hanafis went. Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, said, Al-ghina min akbar al-dhunub allati yajibu tarkuha fawran. He said that singing is one of the, 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 the biggest sins that someone needs to leave immediately. And Imam Malik, when asked about, not when asked about singing, he was asked about people who said singing was permissible. He said, ما يفعله عندنا إلا الفساق. No one would do that except someone who is a dissolute. And it is only the sin people, sinful people who do that. And the scholars say this was also based on the view of the people of Medina. Meaning, the people who lived in the city of Medina and just a few generations ago, they have seen the Prophet وسلم, and the, or the companions of the Prophet وسلم, and how they lived and behaved. So that means they were upon this view as well, because they never saw the companions of the Prophet وسلم, accepting something like that. Imam al Shafi'i said that the person is a fasiq and his testimony is not accepted. He also has another famous saying. He says, I left behind in Baghdad something that the heretics introduced, which they called taghbir with which they distract people from the Qur'an. So as Shafi'i is saying, people started to come up with something called a taghbir. So what is this taghbir? Basically, it's the type of poetry which encourages ascetic life, zuhd, tells you to leave the dunya. And it is sung by someone while he strikes a rod against some kind of drum or dried skin. So this is the comment of a Shafi'i on something like that. Until now, no video, you know, music videos, no poor clothing, no bad words, calling people to leave from the materialism of the world, and yet he called it something that يعني, the heretics introduced, and they distract people from the Qur'an with this. Ahmad ibn Hanbal, rahimahullah, he used to say, Al-ghina yumbut al-nifaq fi al-qalb, wa la yu'jibuni, that it creates, it sprouts hypocrisy in the heart, and I do not like it. And not one of the four madahib said that music is halal. Not one of the four madahib. And of the other scholars, Al-Qasim, he said that singing is part of falsehood. Al-Hasan al-Basri said that if there is music involved in a dinner invitation in a walima, then do not accept the invitation. And the other scholars, Imam Al-Qurtubi, uh, Imam Abu Tayyib Al-Tabari, and Ibn Salah, and Ibn Rajab Al-Hanbali, and Ibn Al-Qayyim, and Ibn Hajar Al-Haythami, and Makhul, and Al-Nawawi, and many others, and Ibn Qadama Al-Maqdisi, and Ibn Taymiyyah, and Al-Sha'bi, and Ibrahim Al-Nakhai, and Abu Thawr, and Nu'man, all of these people, all of these great men, all these big names, saw that it was haram. So who will convince you if these people do not convince you? And Ibn Hajar al-Hanbali, he said that whoever attributes the opinion permitting music to any of the scholars who are respected in legal issues has surely erred. Anyone who says scholars said, this scholar said it's is permissible, and that was a respectable scholar, for sure this person is mistaken. Uh, so this young boy, he's, he was downloading uh, music for free online, and as he was downloading, he saw the length of, of each song and how long it was. And he thought to himself that for the, for the length of this entire song, every second of the length of this song, Allah is going to be upset with me. Every second. And so by himself, he cancelled all of the downloads. The thing that we want to 
remind and maybe conclude with is that death can come at any moment. Know that the angel of death overlooked you and took the souls of your brothers and one day he's going to come to you and overlook others. Some people would be sitting and listening to music without any fear that the angel of death will come upon them at that moment. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he mentions a singer, someone who was a music lover back then in his generation. And he was dying, he was in his deathbed. So they told him, say, La ilaha illallah. And he started to repeat songs. They told him, La ilaha illallah, and he kept singing. And when he couldn't say the words to the songs anymore, he began to make sounds and he would say, Tintina, Tintana, the, 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 the rhythm with his mouth, until the soul left his body. He was not able to say, La ilaha illallah. And in our times today, there is a story told by, in one of the Muslim countries, people who are like doing motorist assistance in the highways in a Muslim country. He says, I got used to seeing horrible things and injured people along the roads. One day we were making our rounds and we heard a sound, a horrible sound of, of two cars that had collided. So we rushed to the area and we found two cars that were in a head-on collision and were utterly destroyed. We rushed to assist the people and it was indescribable. In the first car there were two young men and they were in a very bad state. He says, we took them out as they began to scream from the pain. And we rushed to the other car and we found the driver had died. So we returned to those two. And they were in the state of ihtidar, meaning the soul now is leaving their bodies. So my partner rushed to them to say, and, and would tell them, say, La ilaha illallah. But they would be moaning in pain. La ilaha illallah. And they're not responding. So then when they started to be in the pangs of death, in the last minutes of death, or they were almost dead, they began to repeat words from songs. And they remained repeating these voices until just singing, just singing constantly, just singing lyrics from songs, constantly. He's telling them, La ilaha illallah, and they're only singing from songs. And then these voices, their voices started to gradually decrease. Then the first one became quiet. And after that, the second one became quiet. We put all three in our car and we took them you know, to, to the morgue. He said, my partner and I on the drive to the morgue, we were not speaking. We were both quiet. Suddenly my partner turned to me and he started to talk to me about death and the good and the bad end on earth until we got to the hospital and we put the dead and we left. From that day onwards, every time I attempted to listen to music, I see the images of the two men as they bid farewell to this dunya with the sound of the shaitan. Six months later, there was another accident. It was a young man who had a flat tire and he was fixing it and he got to the back of the car to take the spare out and a speeding car came and it smashed into him. So I quickly went with another one of my co-workers and the young man was on the ground and he had signs of righteousness on him but his body was destroyed from the collision. We put him on the, in the car On on our way I said to myself, I will do as my other friend did and I will get him to say the shahada. And then he started to make sounds that we couldn't figure out. So we were rushing to the hospital. Then his speech began to become clearer. He was reciting the Quran in a beautiful voice. We turned to him and he was reciting with khushu' and sukun. And his bones were broken and he was covered with blood on his clothes and he was on his way to his death. We started to speed up even more. He kept reciting in a beautiful voice. I have never heard a voice of the recitation of the Quran so beautiful. And he was saying, نحن أولياءكم في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة ولكم فيها ما تشتهي أنفسكم ولكم فيها ما تدعون. He was saying, those who say, look at what he is reciting and these are his last words. Those who say, our Lord is Allah and stand straight and steadfast, the angels descend upon them from time to time, saying, fear not and grieve not, but receive the glad tidings of paradise that you were promised. We were your protectors in this, we are your protectors in this life and the next. Imagine reciting these ayat and these words. Where you will have all that your souls desire 
and you will have all that you ask for, a hospitable gift from the one that is most forgiving and most merciful. He says, my co-worker and I listened to that voice. Then suddenly I felt a shiver run through my body and the voice stopped. We turned around and found him with his finger in the air and he was saying, La ilaha illallah. We stopped the car and I jumped and I ran to the back and I touched his hand and I checked his breath and I checked his heartbeat. There was nothing. And I began to cry. My, my partner turned to me and he said, what happened? I said, the young man has died. Mat al -shab. And he, dis and he died while reciting the Qur'an. So my friend exploded into tears. As for me, I could not control myself and I began to cry uncontrollably and my, cares, and my tears wouldn't stop. We continued on the way to the hospital and when we got there we asked his family about him and they said he was praying constantly at night and reciting the Qur'an. And for that there should be then, there should be an admonition and an indication for those of us who walk around with iPods and constantly listen in their cars and in their and online and in the planes and everywhere else. So there should be then an indication and an admonition in that. But a lot of times when we say stories like this, people say, this will not happen to me. I mean, I listen to music, but this won't happen to me. But the truth is, brothers and sisters, this is beyond our control. And I will try to illustrate this to you. Have you ever had a song stuck in your head? A dumb song that perhaps you don't even like. Stuck in your head all day. And you are conscious and awake and you can't get it out of your head. All day. This is while you're conscious and awake and you can't control it. So what about when you're in the stupors of death? Stupors meaning like a drunken state. If you're 100% awake and you can't control a song in your head, what makes you think you can control it when you're in the stupors of death. And a song that you love might come out. And so these songs, they roll off our tongues easily. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to, I'm going to give you some lyrics, all right? And if you can complete them, you can complete them out loud, or you can complete them internally, or you know, whatever you like. We will not accuse you of knowing these songs. Because some of them I had to call friends and got these lyrics from. Some of them I heard from commercials and even in the newscast I would hear them. So if I say, who let the... You know the end. And if I say, oops, I... Don't worry. I love you. You love me. Born to be. You gotta fight for your right to. So embarrassing. <laughs> you ain't nothing but a... Ain't no mountain, I believe I can, you say I'm a dreamer, but we will, we will, R-E-S-P-E-C-P, -E -E find out, how about some difficult ones, under my umbrella, I've never heard this, but they told me you would not know it, been, okay, now for the gangsters, been spending most of their lives living in a, Brothers are like, I don't know. <laughs> how about this one then? All right, all right, all right, all right. You know the rest of it? It's outcast. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, complete the verses. وَمَن يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Excellent. ونصله جهنم وساءت مصيرا. طيب. وقال الرسول يا رب إن قوم اتخذوا هذا القرآن مهجورا. Oh my Lord. The Prophet said, Oh my Lord, truly my people have abandoned the Quran. وما من غائبة في السماء والأرض إلا في كتاب مبين. So what makes us think we will be able to say لا إله إلا الله so easily? When music rolls off our tongue and lyrics rolls off our tongue so easily and the Qur'an has to struggle to come out of our mouth. There was a doctor and he is a, a righteous man inshallah, we don't overpraise him. He said in his career in a Muslim land, 36 people died in front of him. 36 people and he would tell them, say la ilaha illallah. And in his entire career, only one person was able to say la ilaha illallah. And he would say that now 
I guarantee you can say it a million times if you want to right now. And everyone thinks they'll be able to say it. But out of 36, he only saw one person able to say La ilaha illallah. So test yourself. What rolls off of your tongue easily? When you have a close call or you drop something and it breaks, what is the first thing on your tongue? Do you say Bismillah, Subhanallah, La ilaha illallah, Astaghfirullah, or is it a bad word? Oh, sugar or something else. Or do you start damning things because something happened or something broke? So if in this dunya, while you are 100% awake and conscious, the first thing that rolls out of your tongue is something bad or a bad word. What makes you think you can say La ilaha illallah and it will roll off your tongue easily? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Man kana akhir kalamahu fi dunya La ilaha illallah dakhal al-jannah. Whoever his last speech is in this dunya is La ilaha illallah, he will enter into paradise. And so now, the whole point is not to make you think you will not be of those people. Ask Allah Azza wa that all of us are those who say La ilaha illallah is our final word. But the point is to make us afraid of our bad deeds. There was a man, his name was Zadan al-Kindi, and he was a singer. And he sat with a like kind of a, a guitar type instrument with his friends on the road. And he was singing and they were clapping and enjoying. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he came and he passed by them. And so they left. And he grabbed this man, Zadan al-Kindi. He grabbed him and he shook him. And he said, Ya Ghulam, ma ahsana hadha sawt law kana biqra'at al-Qur'an. He said, oh young man, what an excellent voice this would be if only you were reciting the Qur'an. Or in another narration he tells him, لَوْ كَانَ مَا يُسْمَعُ مِنْ حُسْنِ صَوْتِكَ يَا غُلَامِ بِقِرَاءَةِ الْقُرْآنِ كُنْتَ أَنْتَ أَنْتَ He said, if, if what was heard from your voice was the recitation of the Qur'an, كُنْتَ أَنْتَ أَنْتَ Meaning you would have been the one people would turn to, people would look to for leadership. And so, Zadan then, he asked the people, who was that? They told him that was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. He said that was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They said yes. So he ran to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and he began to cry to him and he broke his instrument. And Ibn Mas'ud embraced him and he cried and he said, كيف لا أحب من أحبه الله? He said, How can I not love the one whom Allah loves? Why does Allah love him? Because إن الله يحب التوابين ويحب المتطهرين. Allah loves those who constantly repent and those who purify themselves. So the man repented and that's why Ibn Mas'ud cried and hugged him. And Zadan stayed with him until he became one of the Imams in the Qur'an. Perhaps some people who listened to this were angered by some of my speech because it showed fault in something that they loved. But remember that we're only calling you to something that is more beloved to you. We're calling you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the speech of Allah and to the Qur'an. And no one is offended when he is called to something that is greater. So if you're going to, you're about to eat a meal, and someone invites you to a meal that you love more, you do not become offended. And so that's what we're doing. We're calling people, and we're sure that they love Allah more, and that they love the Quran more. We want people to take the position of Imam Malik when he was a young boy, and he wanted to become a singer, and his mother moved him towards knowledge, and now he's one of the Imams of the Ummah. Today, Islam really and truly needs you to defend it against atheism, to bring people to Allah, to teach the youth and to teach the kids their religion and the proper role models to have, and to defend it against ideological attacks and political attacks. Your Prophet ﷺ is being insulted every month and every year. Will you plug up your ears with your iPod as if nothing happened? It's difficult to stop yourself.